Please rise and join me in our call to worship. From Psalms 96, 1 through 4a. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Declare God's glory among the nations. Declare his wondrous works among all people, because the Lord is great and his Lord be praised. Our song is hymn number 121, Easter Day, that joy was bright. Reading verses 54 to 62. 
They arrested Jesus and led him away and brought him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed far behind them. After the soldiers started a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat together, Peter sat with them. A servant girl saw Peter sitting there in the firelight and looked closely at him. She said, this man was also with him. Peter said, this was not true. He said, woman, I don't know him. A short time later, another person saw Peter and said, you are also one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. About an hour later, another man insisted, certainly this man is with him because he's from Galilee too. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, at once, while Peter was still speaking, a rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And Peter remembered what the Lord had said, Before the rooster crows this day, you will say three times that you don't know me. And then Peter went outside and cried painfully. Well, that's Peter's sad story, now for Peter's redemption story. In John chapter 21. Later, Jesus himself appeared again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. This is how it happened Simon Peter, Thomas called Dimas, Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two other disciples were together. Peter, Simon Peter told them, I'm going fishing. And they said, We'll go with you. So they sat out in the boat, but throughout the night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize it was Jesus. And Jesus called them, Children, have you caught anything to eat? They answered him, No. He said, Cast your nets on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they did. And there were so many fish that they couldn't call them the net. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. And Simon Peter heard it was the Lord who wrapped his coat around him, he'd been naked, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they weren't far from shore, only about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you just caught. So Simon Peter got up and pulled the net to shore. It was full of large fish, 153 of them. Yet the net hadn't torn, even with so many fish. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples could bring themselves to ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This is now the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he raised from the dead. When they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon replied, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. Jesus asked a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Jesus said to him, Simon replied, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, Take care of my sheep. He asked a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was sad that Jesus had asked him a third time, Do you love me? He replied, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Jesus said to him, Be my sheep. I assure you that when you were younger, you tied your own belt and walked around wherever you wanted. When you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and another will tie your belt and lead you where you don't want to go. He said this to show the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And after saying this, Jesus said to Peter, Follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Bold, brash Peter. 
He lived his life full of steam ahead. Stop and reflect later. Maybe. He's a guy who literally jumped in with both feet, no hesitation, and then figured out whether he would sink or swim or need some help from Jesus. Not only in this post-Easter story, but maybe you remember the one about asking Jesus to call him to walk with Jesus on the water? That one went fine as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, didn't think about what he was doing. Not so well when he thought about it and panicked. Well, some of us live our lives like Peter. We live life to the fullest. We deal with the consequences later. And some of us are far more cautious. But even so, there are things that we can learn from Peter's story. There's a reason why these two scriptures work back to back. In the first passage, Peter disappoints himself by renouncing Jesus three times. And in the second one, Peter reaffirms his relationship with Jesus by responding, Yes, I love you, three times. One declaration for each denial. Peter, who for three years has left everything behind, his business, his family, his village, his familiar, safe, comfort zone life, to follow this traveling teacher who just might be the long-awaited Messiah. Peter, who just a few hours ago pledged his loyalty to defend Jesus no matter what. Peter, who was willing to take on the arresting soldiers, the Jewish officials and their servants with just one sword. Peter, who quietly followed Jesus to see what would happen when confronted with his own connection to the teacher he admires and loves, suddenly panics and denies even knowing him. Not just once, but three times. I mean, seriously, why else would he have been standing by that campfire in the middle of the night? It's not like he knew anyone else there. No one invited him. No one even knows that he's there. He showed up when he was, Jesus was taken inside to be questioned. If he wasn't there because of Jesus, he would have been home in bed. He had the same accent. He was from the same part of the country. Peter had been with Jesus. And Peter denied the whole thing until the rooster crowed, just as Jesus said. And then Peter broke down and cried. Talk about regret. Peter knows regret. In that moment, for all the times that Peter has opened his mouth and inserted foot, for all the times that Peter has ventured into deep waters without a flotation device, literally and figuratively, for all the times that Peter has made a fool of Himself. He was pretty good at that. For all of that, Peter has never regretted anything as deeply as he regrets denying Jesus right in that moment when the rooster broke. He hangs his head in shame and he cries. Now, for some of you, a moment of regret might not come to mind immediately. There are little things that I regret over the years, things I regret saying, things I regret the way I said them, times that I wish I'd been brave enough to speak the truth in love, times I wish I'd made a different decision, Times I wish I had been more mature or more disciplined. Times I wish I had known better and times I did know better and chose to do the wrong thing anyway. I can regret any and all of those. For others of you, there may be one big thing, one 
deep, dark secret, one serious regret that shaped the rest of your lives, or at least a portion of it. There may be one thing you wish you could take back, or one thing that you wish you had done differently. And now, for at least part of your life, you felt stuck, trapped, or buried in regret, or guilt, or shame, or all three. That's what Peter felt like when the rooster crowed. Now, if the story ended there, Peter would be a tragic figure in history, if we even remembered him at all. Peter would be like Judas, who's remembered only for betrayal and suicide. But Peter didn't stay stuck in his regret. And you and I don't have to either. Regret is not how Jesus wants any of us to spend the rest of our lives. So instead, Jesus offers each one of us the opportunity to repent. Every time we mess up, Jesus offers us ways to turn things around and be redeemed. For Peter, he came on the beach over breakfast. Peter was restless that morning, sitting still in the upper room, waiting for he wasn't sure what. And sitting still just was not Peter's style. Perhaps the denials of that early Friday morning were still ruminating around in his mind. So the man of action first, then later, stood up and said, I'm going fishing. Who's going with me? And off they went. They spent an evening fishing with no luck. They fished all night. No luck. Action for the sake of action does not always yield positive results. We know that all too well. So weary and more restless than ever, they hear a familiar voice from shore. They don't recognize it right away, but eventually at least John does. Put your nets down on the other side. And of course, we come up full of fish. In his excitement, realizing that it's Jesus, Peter jumps in, he struggles ashore while his companions are struggling to bring in all those fish. And it ends up being a good morning. The fish are tasty, the conversation is light. But in the back of Peter's mind, he still wondered where he stands with this man that he respects so much. Peter's thinking, I know he knows. I've let him down. He's got to be so disappointed in me. Why doesn't he say something? I just want him to chew me out like he used to, then in the over with. Well, I know what that feels like. When I think that I have disappointed or offended someone, my first thought is to avoid them. But then at the same time, I'm worrying about that, and it takes over at least half of my brain until, until I have a conversation that reassures me that I've been forgiven. And that's what Peter needed. And Jesus knew it so well. So Jesus turns to Peter and he says, Do you love me? Well, of course I love you. You know that. Jesus never exactly asks Peter to confess. He doesn't explicitly say, I forgive you. But this is regarded as the motivation and the effect of this conversation. Jesus asks three times, one for each time that Peter messed up. Jesus gives him an opportunity to confirm the relationship 
that he previously denied. Anyone ever done that for you? Given a chance to reestablish or reaffirm a relationship that you had previously messed up? It might be with an employer or a neighbor, family member or a friend. But when we've done something or said something that causes a disconnect, we need a chance to reconnect. And we're restless until that happens. That's what it was like for Peter. But here's what I want you to remember. The mistakes Peter made were not enough to hold Jesus back from becoming the foundation or making Peter the foundation of the church. When Jesus met Simon for the first time, he could see into this man's heart past the brash, bold, restless, foot and mouth, act first, then later, rough and rugged fisherman. Jesus saw the hard working, passionate, loyal friend and potential leader that Peter could become. Jesus sees all of your best qualities and your potential too. Jesus gave Simon a new name, not a replacement name, but more like a nickname, because what we read as Peter meant in the language that they spoke, rock. It's not that different from when my pastor called me Gypsy. Colleen's my name, Gypsy is my nickname, but it's also part of my character. Simon was given the name but Peter, the rock, described his character. Now, a rock can be a stumbling block or this annoying bit of something that you can't get out of your shoe. It can be the thing you stub your toe on or the thing that hurts to walk on barefoot. It can be a huge, solid block that you can't move by yourself no matter how hard you try. And Peter could be as stubborn and annoying as that kind of rock. But, on the other hand, a rock can be an anchor to hold something in place, like the rocks that Bob and Mary used when they were repairing the floor in the sanctuary last week. Or, a rock can be a solid foundation, a base for something. It, it might be the doorstop that holds a door open. Rocks are what we use to hold the doors open upstairs during Wednesday early out. A rock can be a building block for something that's going to be sturdy and last a long time. Look at the walls around you. Peter had qualities that Jesus needed to build the church. Something that for all her faults and trials along the way has lasted already for nearly 2,000 years. John Carver points out that Peter, in spite of all his weaknesses and mistakes, was also able to learn three significant leadership qualities Submission, restraint, and humility. We may or may not think of those as leadership qualities, but they're important. And notice that I said he was able to learn these. They didn't come pre-installed. Peter was able to change. And that makes all the difference. The stubborn man learned to submit to someone he recognized as a higher authority. The restless, jumping feet first and later guy learned to restrain himself and follow Jesus leading. The bold, all about me, I want to be first fellow learned to humble himself and admit when he was wrong. That's 
huge. To society, sometimes those qualities look meek, maybe even mousy. But to Jesus, those were the building blocks of a character that was capable of integrity, wisdom, and leadership. Peter's life could change because Peter allowed Jesus to make a difference. Peter didn't let his past define him. He allowed Jesus to redesign his future. Peter didn't get stuck in regret. He repented. His mistakes didn't hold him back, but forgiven, they increased his love and passion to move forward. Romans 12, 2 says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. That's what Peter did. And so can you. If there are things about your life that aren't right, give them to God. Turn to Jesus and let him transform you. Did you notice this is not a self-done makeover? You need to go to the one who created you for the real deal. But whatever changes are needed in your life, in your attitude, in your behavior, in your character, in your habits, Jesus is the one with the power to make a difference, good or small. Satisfied just the way you are right now? Well, me too some days, and that's a miracle. But you and I both know there's always room for improvement. Got a secret or a regret in your past? Start to let go by bringing it openly to Jesus and ask for his help. Here's another question you might want to ask yourself today. Is there someone in your life who might need your forgiveness, your encouragement, your affirmation, your example to accept changes that need to be made in their life? Your story, your forgiveness, your acknowledgement might be just what they need to turn to Jesus themselves. So live your changed lives honestly in front of them. Because lives can change for the better. And that's what Jesus was all about. Turn in your hymnals to number 355 or follow along on the screen as we say, hear the good news of salvation. I want you to know the background to this hymn. It comes from um, a Native American affirmation of faith from the Dakota tribe. But we get to sing the words in English.
As we take a moment of silence to begin our prayers, let your prayers include regrets of the past that you need to get rid of. Turn them over to the Lord. But also ask the Lord to show you where someone else needs to hear, whether they've asked for it or not, needs to hear that you forgive them and that you love them. Might be the best thing you can do today. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, hear us as we pray. As we turn not only our thoughts, but also our hearts and our lives to you. Thank you for all that you did for us. Not only teaching us and dying for us, but rising again to give us hope, to redeem our relationship with you and through you to reconcile us with God, our Creator. Thank you. Lord, as we look around at the people in our lives and the things going on in this world, there are so many situations we need to lift to your throne of mercy and grace. So while we do that silently in our hearts, we also lift up to you friends and church folk who need healing. We pray for Lois Bach that you will bring healing to her body, to her lungs, and to her heart. We pray for Heiko that you will bring healing to his wrist and to his ears. We pray for Deb Thomas that you will bring her relief and see her through her treatments and that you will heal her. We pray for others, Lord, who have been ill or who need strength. We pray for those who need help to fight against pain on a daily basis. We pray, Lord, for those who fight unseen battles. We pray for those with mental illness, chronic pain, financial struggles, broken relationships. And for those who have turned away from you and don't know how to turn back by themselves. We pray for those who are still defiant, still trying to make it on their own. We pray, Lord, for those making difficult decisions, whether to move, whether to change a job, whether to take this treatment or that, which candidate to vote for, which office will make a difference. We pray, Lord, for governments, that they will lead us in the right direction and make healthy decisions for the communities they govern. We pray, Lord, for the world around us, for the environment, for nations. We ask that more and more and more of your people might live in peace rather than violence. We pray for those working to bring relief or to rebuild. For every way that some human being in this world reaches out to help another. Because all of that fits what you want for us. 
all of these and other things in our hearts and our thoughts today, Lord, we lift to you. For you are the one who saves us, and you are the one who makes a difference. And so, Lord, we pray now as you once taught your disciples to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us your say our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us bring now our tithes and our offerings to the Lord.
And now may the God of all hope fill you with joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope in Him through the Holy Spirit. Amen.